so, so, so after this long gap, we continue our lectures in the theory. Uh, we go on to the end of this semester and probably continue through next semester, provided you guys are interested. Okay, so uh, uh, in this this semester, uh, the things I want to talk about are just the date. Date, yes. What's the date today, somebody know? Okay, so the plan for this semester is to, uh, is to discuss um, open strings. This is, this is continuing with the bulldog string to start with. Open strings to discuss toroidal compactifications and de duality, uh, d brains, or one loop amplitudes in string theory. Um, you know, we'll you know, we talk about oriented models and so on. Yeah, this, this, this thing will go on for about four or five lectures, maybe five or six. And uh, we'll go on to, dis uh, to discuss uh, local physics on the world sheet of the string, to uh, derive the beta function equations on the world sheet of the string, and to connect that with the equations of space time, science, time, science, 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 science. To discuss string, th string theory curves. That will be another three lectures or so. Uh, and so that's eight or nine lectures, maybe ten lectures for all of this. And after which we will continue with the, uh, to the discussion of the super string. Okay? Um, we'll discuss, uh, we'll, we'll try to do a sort of thorough discussion of coefficient theory with the super string. We'll discuss what's called the RNS formalism, which is what's given in Kulchinsky. But I was thinking we should also discuss the Berkowitz sub formalism, which is a new, new thing developed since Kulchinsky's book and uh, seems to be proving it in the use. Uh, I don't know, the, I don't understand that formalism yet, so that's a motivation for us. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that will probably take us through to the end of the semester. I mean, let me say, uh, with, you know, if things go really well, the next semester we start trying to discuss space science. So brain solutions, supersymmetry, space science, huh? and the ADS safety constraints. Okay, fine. So now let's, let's, let's start. So uh, our mission for now is to, if you remember last, last year, well, last semester we discussed the bosonic string reasonably thoroughly. You know, the closed bosonic string, we understood it in many ways. Okay? Uh, that's of course a toy model for most of real string theory, and we're going to stick with the toy model in some more time, just so as to avoid uh, large complexities, as you will see when we without without being conceptual, as you will see when we start standing super string. But anyway, so let's start stick with this one. Okay? So what we want to discuss is the open string. Okay. Now, what do I mean? If you remember, the way we started our lectures, um, 70 or 80 lectures ago or whatever, was to look at world sheets that propagated like that, with little cylinders that were propagating in time, and we tried to write down an action that described uh, the propagation of these, uh, of these, these strings. But, you see, um, we assumed that the strings, that, and then we did a lot of work, but we assume that the strings we looked at were these little loops that went propagating through. Now, you might ask, are there any other possibilities? Now that we've done all the work, we've understood the local physics and the world sheet of the strip very well. You might understand that you might wonder if the same local physics might describe other motions. Okay? And the natural thing to wonder about, you know, if you've got a bit of string, well, there are many things you can do, so that if you think in space time, but intrinsically, what you can do, there's basically two things. You can keep it open. Closed. So we've discussed closed strings so far. Well. Now you might wonder what, what's what's the story of open strings. So could we discuss strings that are little lines rather than little loops? And understand their proportion especially. So that's the question we're going to address. Okay. So what we're going to assume, you know, much of our analysis has been local and the world sheet of the string. Okay? And so suppose you've got a world sheet like this or a world sheet like this, we take a little local branch. Yeah. It doesn't care. It doesn't know the difference. So all that was local on the world sheet the string will carry through. So all we have to do is to worry about new effects coming from the fact that we have the objects. Okay? So let's start in a low-brow way. Let's start as if we were starting with the first lecture for closed strings. Okay? And uh, try, to, try to progress from there. So if you remember that the way we tried to quantize we start with what was our basic action, we had one of four pi and one of prime, with the minus in some way of writing it. Square root g times g alpha beta del alpha x mu 
tard. Ok? And then, uh, in both our initial low brow as well as our more sophisticated ways of working with this action, we effectively fixed a gauge in which this G was some standard metric. And if we were working with the cylinder, it's just a flat metric with the theta coordinate periodic, the periodic theta of pi, and the tau coordinate ring. And then we worked with that metric for much of what, what we were doing. Okay, so now what we're going to try to do is the following. We're going to try to see if we can again, once again, fix the gauge. We keep G to be the flat metric in a space parameterized by zero and uh, by sigma and, and tau, but sigma will run from zero to pi instead of to pi, and we will not impose a periodicity on this. It will not be a close metric. Just, just be a strip. Tau runs up here. Okay. Now, having said that we're not going to impose periodicity on the string, on the string in order to make it a well-defined and dynamical system, we have to impose some boundary conditions at the edge of the string. So let's see how that goes. So the condition that we're going to impose in a well-defined dynamical system, the system from which you go. Well, if you take the action of the system and you vary the action, you get well-defined equations of motion. So let's see. We, suppose you start with this action. Yeah. And you vary the action with respect to x. What do you get? Well, uh, the usual procedure of getting equations of motions it puts one delta on this x here, and then you integrate by parts. Okay? And the equations of motion are what's left once you throw away the surface. Now that we've got a boundary of our space time, we should worry about the surface. So what's the bound? What's the surface? So the surface term is proportional to integral of it's del alpha square root g, g alpha beta, x mu, del beta, x Okay. Well, del x mu. Okay. Now, of course, this is a total derivative, so it can be integrated to something of the boundary. So what is, what is it on the boundary? Well, we use Stokes here, right? So it's the dot product of this vector with the normal to the boundary, OK? So we can use Stokes theorem and rewrite this as proportional to, effectively, uh, okay, this vector, whatever it is, this vector, whatever it is, uh, dotted with the uh, normal to the boundary. Now what's this vector? This vector is uh, let's move to flat space just to clear maybe that's what we're going to do. This vector is essentially delta x mu times del alpha of delta x mu. Okay? So this vector is supposed, let's call it t alpha. Okay? If we want the equations of motion follow from variation of the action, this vector on the boundary should give us zero. Okay, so that we can do this integration by parts to recover the equations of motion. Okay, now there are two natural ways to, uh, to, to have this uh, uh, ve vector dotted with the boundary, uh, dotted with the normal to the boundary by zero. The first way is to impose the delta x mu equals. That is to say that x is some fixed value at the boundary. So the boundary conditions are that x is something fixed. Okay, that would certainly do it. This is that x we will vanish. But there's a second way. And the second way is to demand that del alpha x mu dotted with the boundary, boundary normal, is equal to zero. That will also do it for arbitrary fluctuation field del x mu. Is this clear? Okay? Now these two things have names. The first boundary condition is called Dirichlet boundary conditions. And the second boundary condition is called Neumann boundary conditions. Okay? The first guy is just saying that x can't change the boundary. The second guy is saying that the normal derivative of x at the boundary is zero. It's sort of like reflecting boundary conditions. Okay? Now, uh, we continue this 
spirit of, uh, uh, of the earlier lectures and we search for solutions to string theory that are in Okay, so in principle you could do something with x1, something else with x2 and so on. But let's to start with search for solutions to string theory that are full range of variance of n six dimensions. So you achieve that by either choosing this boundary condition or this boundary condition for all the six dimensions. Now let's see what will happen if you choose this boundary condition. If you choose this boundary condition for all the six dimensions, you will have the zero mode of the string stuck near some place in both space and time. Right, because the end points of the string will be stuck to some point in space time. So maybe the middle of the string can fluctuate away a little bit, but not very far. This will not describe particle propagations. Particle lives at all times in time. Okay? Uh, as we go on to that study string theory, we will find that actually this does describe something interesting. It describes an instant dawn in a path integral in string theory. It's what's called a D instant dawn. But at the moment we just discuss this. This, this is not what we want for now. So the only lens in there in boundary condition in what we've discussed so far is to have this boundary condition imposed for all 26 dimensions of space. Now space time. Is this clear? Okay. So now let's take our boundary condition seriously and deal with it. So once again, we are, we work, we are working with this trip. We have sigma goes from 0 to pi. And we've got various fields in x. So I'm going to now discuss the quantization of any given field x. So they ignore the label of x. They have the mu label on x. They all behave equivalently. Yeah, as you know. So we've got some field x which has which uh, which is x of sigma, and we have that del sigma of x at zero is equal to del sigma of x at pi is equal to zero. Okay, now this is all classical. We're interested in the 
quantum, to quantum solution to this problem. It's a free theory. It's a classical solution determines the quantum solution. Um, all we need to know is what the right term. So each of these ANs will be promoted. These ANs, this X and the P will be promoted to an operator. All we need to know is what the right commutation related to the operators OK? So let's work that out, like we did for the closed string. Uh, again, working in this slightly more sophisticated way than is usual, just because it's so convenient. OK? So like we did for the closed string, what we do is work on the symplectic form on the space of classical solutions. OK? So the symplectic form is simply 1 by 2 pi alpha prime into del delta of x dot where delta of x. Okay, now uh, integrate it over. Okay, what have I written? Delta x x dot by two pi alpha prime is the momentum conjugate. So what I've written is delta of p of sigma where delta of x of sigma integrated over the uh, over the world sheet of the, of the string. Okay? And uh, uh, does everyone remember what this means? We discussed it when we discussed the pure string or something. Do you remember what this means? This, this is a simple way of encoding computation relations. Okay, so the, the coefficients. Okay, so uh, uh, a space that has omega alpha, beta, delta, x alpha, wedge, delta, x beta, okay, is, a, is a space whose commutators between x alpha and x beta are the inverse of this omega matrix, up to some factors of 2 and so on. That you find in your notes from last semester. Okay? So I'm just encoding the commutation relations, okay, in a simple fashion. Uh, and basically what I've done here is canonical uh, uh, quantization. The fact that the basic commutation relation is P commutator X as one. I've written that in a fancy way. Okay? Now this formal way is convenient because it allows you to change variables. So this is, the, this is the symplectic form in the space of x fields. But we want the symplectic form in the space of a's, x and p. So all we do is take this general expansion here and plug it in. And that will give us the symplectic form in the space of a's, x's and this. OK? So let's, let's move. So, so let's do the plugging in. So let's, now, now first thing you see, when we plug in, we get things that have particular sigma dependences. And the integral from 0 to pi will kill the, uh, will give us zero integral unless the sigma dependence is exactly cancel. OK? So because we've got, we've got cosine, and you integrate it, sine, sine of 0, sine of pi, up with 0. OK? So uh, uh, what we need is exact cancellation of these exponents. So uh, let's see how that's arranged. Firstly, of course, zero mode can only click with a zero mode. Okay, so let's work out first the zero. So what what we get from here? X dot gets no contribution from X because there's no tau dependence. So X dot is two alpha prime uh, integral delta p wedge delta x. Uh, integral delta p which delta x. There's no delta p which delta p because that's zero. It's anti symmetric. So once we chose that to be delta p, the next one has to be delta x. And we have this integral. Uh, we have 2 pi alpha prime. And we have this integral of sigma. The integral of sigma goes from 0 to pi. Uh, so we get 2 alpha prime divided by 2 pi alpha prime, is equal to, which is equal to dp which dx. But this is the standard symplectic form between two variables that obey the commutation relation. X commutator P is equal to I. The I is going from classical to quantum. Okay? 
Okay, this is what we started with in the field. Dp by dx. This is the step. That's why I chose this to all the power. You know, so as to get this to be the standard. If I didn't know what to start with, I would put an arbitrary concept that chose it to get. Okay? Good. Now let's move on and do the oscillators. So for the oscillators, once again, you only have to worry about what you get when n's are either equal or opposite. But n's equal don't contribute because delta an where delta a n is zero. Is that symmetric? So you only have to worry about what you get when n's are opposite. Okay? So let's 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 do that. So what do we get? So let's take uh, delta x dot and act from here. So you get delta a n. Okay? And then we need to dot this. So we get uh, now both of these things have the same time dependence. So i n times e to the power i n sigma plus e to the power minus i n sigma with a particular time dependence. Then we're going to multiply by a minus n that is the reverse time dependence, time dependence cancel. And so we get delta a n which delta a minus n um, and e to the power i n sigma uh, plus e to the power i n sigma okay and this thing has to be integrated this thing the whole thing has a 2 pi alpha prime and it has to be integrated over one sigma this integral is 2 pi. Is it 2 over that? Uh, 2 over which comes from the that modulation. Thanks. Sorry, that question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Square root that. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a factor of 2 over alpha prime because we were clever about choosing our normalizations. So, right. so, 2 over alpha. Should have been alpha prime. Alpha prime over two. We were so clever. <laughs> okay. So now what do we get? Let's do this integral. The integral gives us two. This takes with this. This takes with this. It gets two pi. Okay. Or another way of saying it is that this is two cosine. That is two cosine. So it's four cos squared. Cosine average is half. So it's two times pi. Okay. So what do we get? We get uh, one by four pi times 2 pi times d a n wedge d a minus n times i times a okay but this is what we got when we chose a in here a in taking the dot and minus a in the undot n in taking the dot, a n in taking, so in the guy where we took the dot, and a minus n where we didn't take the dot. There's also a term with the other guy. Uh, with the other guy, the other, that term is also 2 pi by 4 pi into delta a minus n, where delta a n, but with a minus i, because it just replace n by minus n. It's exactly the same thing, right? But that's good because this thing is anti-symmetric. So when we put this back here, that cancels the next thing. Okay? So the next next symplectic form is gets rid of this half. So it's sum over n e n delta a n which delta a minus n uh, with an i n. Oh, and we should have been even clearer when choosing our expansion. We should have been putting in. Sorry, people. Let's just you want to stick to. If you want to stick to standard string theory conventions. Sorry. 
Delta of Delta X, exactly. Standard string theory convention, we expand with an A. So this whole thing comes with a memory.
What, what, what? Uh, no, it, it will make a difference in the mass uh, once we start computing the, uh, the uh, yeah, because momentum is what becomes del by del x. Wait for So it's important. So this is the right thing that preserves the xp XB combination. Okay. Now, uh, before, we, we're soon going to go on to talk about what this means in space time. You know, what, what spectrum we get of the open string space time. But before doing that, let me tell you about uh, um, a little trick that people find very useful also. And that little trick is what's called the doubling trick. Okay. And the, the uh, basis of the doubling, doubling trick is a very simple observation. It says consider any function y, which is defined from 0 to 2, defined from 0 to 2 pi. It's a periodic function. Y is a periodic function defined from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? Periodic. Now, let's define an auxiliary function starting with y, which we call x. As follows. Where x is defined in, in, in x, we define sigma in the range 0 to 1. Y, but it will be 
Um, that's right. Uh, for, 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 yeah, there will be different Ys that give us the same things. But we won't, we won't bother. You know, we're not going really to use this in any way except for convenience. This is going to be a mathematical trick that will be useful. So for the x's that we're considering, we will find a y. Okay, that does what we want. And this will be all that we need. Yes, for any x that is square. You just written down the most general x uh, that satisfies the public, and we'll find a y for it. So that will demonstrate. Um, Okay, now I want to claim that the right y function is y of z is equal to alpha prime by 2 sum n is equal to minus infinity to infinity again excluding 0 a n e to the power i n tau plus c. Okay, and then say plus uh, x plus 2 alpha, right? 1 over. Okay, why is this correct? Uh, this is correct basically because if I replace this by 2 pi minus sigma, the 2 pi doesn't do anything. Because it's Where? No, no, no. This this part is not affected by it. This is not a function of scale. Okay? This whole doubling trick will only be useful for the oscillators. You see, this is not a canonical quantization. Yeah, it's only. Okay. No, uh, okay, then we are defining x as y plus ah. y of sigma y to y minus sigma by 2. Oh. oh, good, 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 good. We probably want to buy. No, no, we don't want to buy. So you, you, you're just saying this should be divided by by two? Yeah, properties. Properties. Yeah. Okay. So uh, okay. So why do we get this? It's because the rule says that we should add y of two pi minus sigma, but the two pi doesn't do anything because of the end here. So it's just y of minus sigma, which is this. So it's manifest that this guy goes. Okay, under this, uh, under this map, right? Uh, I'll emphasize that this is a mathematical trick. You might think this is an unmotivated thing to do, but it's a mathematical trick that will prove useful in any context. Though it will only prove useful for the oscillators. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll see what what goes. Okay, now uh, you see the key point is the following. The quantization that we achieved of our uh, of our system is exactly the quantization you would get for this expansion of y from the closed stream for the oscillators, not for the zeros. If you remember, for the closed string, what we had was a left moving sector and a right moving sector that didn't talk to each other. There was a left matching condition. But we've not yet got to the point of imposing constraints. We're just working out the quantization of this world sheet. Okay? So the left movers, the right movers didn't talk to each other. The quantization, we have quantization of a n and a minus n within left movers, and a n tilde and a, a minus n tilde within right movers. And we had exactly this expansion for the left movers to get the standard commutation prediction. Okay? So, suppose we formally thought of the action as, you know, being a closed string, a periodic closed string, but we expanded solutions with only left movers. We would get exactly the same quantization. Okay? As for the open string. Now, in successive steps, we'll use this, this observation again and again and again. It's a mathematical trick, but sometimes a little slippery in your mind. But it's very useful. So we'll use it again and again and again. So keep, I mean, fine. Now, let's, let's use this to, uh, um, uh, okay, now there's one more thing. So far, we've only, we've 
we've only been discussing these x's. But let's talk also about uh, let's talk also about uh, the stress tensors. Okay. So remember, of course, that there were two important stress tensors in the game. There was oops. Okay. So there were two important stress tensors in the game. There was t plus plus and t minus minus. T plus minus is just you know the trace. Okay, now remember that d plus plus is proportional to del plus x, del plus x, and d minus minus was proportional to del minus x, del minus x. Okay, so uh, now let's look at this in a little more detail. You see, let's look at what the boundary conditions impose that that, that the x fields have on the boundaries, what in that implies for the boundary conditions on t plus plus and t minus. Okay? So, before, before going to that, you know, like all the other, uh, I mean, the definition of plus and minus and all the same. All the same. It's plus is tau plus sigma, minus is tau plus. Okay? Now, the condition that we had in the boundaries was del sigma of x. Del sigma is simply is proportional to del plus minus del minus. Okay, so in terms of plus minus, the boundary condition is the same as saying del plus x equals del minus. That's the boundary. Okay, so multiply again by del plus x and del minus x, we get the condition that t plus plus at zero is equal to t minus minus. And t plus plus at five is equal to t minus minus at five. Okay? So this thing tells us to define a t, okay, formula, formula trick, a t plus plus, you know, extended, which is equal to t plus plus uh, of sigma when sigma belongs to. 0 and 5 and is equal to t minus minus oh, what is it? 2 pi plus sigma when sigma belongs to pi 2 yeah pi 2 2 pi Just the same condition as enclosing 
just T plus plus is equal to 0. Or why every point of the straight? Now, the great thing is that this reduces to a problem that we already, we already solved before. Yeah, why is t plus plus zero? Remember, <coughs> so this is the old logic. Remember, we started off with an action that had both stress tensor as well as x. Okay, then we fix gauge to set the stress tensor to be this conformal gauge. But there are the g equations that you can pose. Well, one of them was automatic, stress, but t plus plus and t minus plus. And to be imposed. And that's how we first did our quantization. So we set to do the same thing for the object. Okay? So that requires us to point by set t plus plus and t minus minus equal to zero from zero to pi. But that's the same thing as setting t plus plus tilde equal to zero on the whole circle. But if you remember what we did when we quantized the closed tree. We set both t plus plus and t minus minus to zero on the whole circle. But t plus plus cared only about the x plus part. So this is exactly the same thing as a quantization. Because now we got an expansion in terms of which we've got the same commutation relation as one half of the toe string and the same constraints as one half of the toe Apart from the zero. Right. Okay? So, exactly. So now let's deal with that additional factor of two. So the only complication is that additional factor of two. Okay. So now let me remind you what we got when we quantize the toe string. What we got, of course, when, but, but you remember the first way we did was, and let's repeat that for a moment, we did a light cone gauge. So we set two of the transverse fluctuations times one spatial coordinate to zero, and, but then we still had to impose L0 equals zero. Okay? And the L0 equals zero condition gave us that, um, go, it was, uh, We got alpha in the flow when we work on the closed string, we got alpha prime p squared by 4 plus some form n is equal to 1 to infinity uh, alpha minus n alpha n. And now I'll replace all the which which x in this is. Okay, so this is the full, full vector p mu squared and i squared. And then we got this equal to g minus 2 over n. I'm not going to derive this again because we did this in great detail. You have this in your notes. You have your notes. Uh, okay? But, uh, um, okay, so, and you remember that we had various ways of understanding that d had to be equal to 26. Okay? Um, so, let's just see what changes. The only thing that changes here is that p is replaced by 2. As we've seen. So, this becomes an alpha prime p squared plus this. Because the zero expansion was different by that factor. Okay? So this, the full quantization of the open string, including all the constraints, gives us one half of the closed string. Okay? But there's one change. Now, if we wanted to, we could go through the logic. Uh, uh, let's examine the spectrum. Okay? Because we have 20,000 ways of seeing the these equal 26. But we had one nice way of seeing just the light code. Can anyone remind me what that way of way was of seeing the light cone gauge when you did close strings? Okay, first see that it has some gauge ingredients and then set it to the But one why does it have gauge ingredients? Because you can uh, okay. Let's do light cone. I, I your, 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 the thing you're talking about is canonical. So let's see, go ahead. Okay, light cone, you have to evaluate the reverse cone. Okay, that's one way of thinking, but just the other spectrum is something easier. And, and, uh, uh, so, in the lift, we had this uh, tachyon, and the, at the first level, we had, to, we had the massless particle, and uh, ah. for, uh, that had, had to be a particular representation of the, yeah. the middle group, and that. Very good. So, what Josephine is saying 
is that at the first level, there are d minus two particles of that energy. Yeah, so this has to be in the right way. If we are maintaining Lorentz invariance, it has to be the representation of the little group of the theory that is d minus two energy. But there is no representation of S O d minus one. That is d minus two energy. Ah, but there is a representation of S O d minus two that is d minus two energy. In the way. Okay? All particles have to transform in representations of the little group if you maintain the Lorentz Now there are two options: either the particle is massless or it's massive. It could be tactical, but that's not going to change. Okay? So either if it's massive, it has to transform into representation d minus one, s o d minus one. But there's no representation of s o d minus one that is that is d minus two energy. So it can't be massive. So the only the only way it could be consistent is if it's massless. Okay? Which, but it's massless if this is equal to one. Okay? So d is twenty six. So we replace. This. Okay? Uh, now, so we have the same logic for the open string. Actually, in the closed string, it's more complicated because we have to take the thing from the left and the thing from the right. So this is the, lo the logic that I spelled out. Was really the logic for the open string, and it's massless. So, it's, so, so what, what, what is our spectrum? So, at lo lowest level, we've got uh, a tachyon when this is zero. Uh, m squared is equal to minus one. Right? P squared is minus n squared. Okay. Next up, we've got a gauge mode because it's a massless depth of field. The only way to make a consistent theory of mass is the gauge mode. And then at high levels, we've got whatever you've got. Can somebody remind me why uh, this problem of uh, this problem of having representations of SO d minus one rather than d minus uh, two does not affect the next second excited state. Now it looks like everything is in representations of S O D minus two, right? Uh, but why D minus two, by the way? Because the I and the C light one quantization run from one to D minus two. Okay, so what's well, why doesn't this argument also tell us that the second excited state has to be massless? Which of course would be a contradiction. Right? It couldn't be the first and second. So it's good we're in the open stream now because this is a review of everything we did for the first. <laughs> so can you list all the particles that, have, that appear at this level? Ten, ten, ten. What are we going Symmetric tensor. Let's just call it the symmetric tensor. This thing is what I'm saying. 
vector. What can you build a representation of S O T minus one by combining these two? It's the symmetric traceless vector. Of S O T minus. Okay. Uh, of S O T minus one. See, so you've got a symmetric tensor S O T minus one. We'll decompose it into D minus two. It's a symmetric and traceless. So because it's traceless, let's say that we we can effectively get rid of this degree. So we get this vector, same as this vector, it's one vector. And then we've got a full symmetric tensor that's not necessarily traceless. Alright? So this is the state content of a representation of SOD minus one. So it's possible that things group together into representations of SOD minus one. You work this out at higher levels, you find the same vertical happens. At every level, and then there's formal proof that it works. Okay? So it's only at level one, but there's only one state. So you could combine together with something else to form a representation of SOD minus D minus one. And every higher level, there are many kinds of things that can combine together. Okay? Good. So, um, so fine. So, uh, so, so we have this all working nicely. Uh, the only thing that's changed is that we don't have to tensor the left movers and the right movers. So at level one, we generally have a gauge boson. What, what do we have at level one from in the closed framework? Uh, Only the graph class? We have the graph class, that's correct. But what else? Tachyon was not at level one, so that's zero. What else do we have at level one? What? Very good. B mu nu. The anti symmetric guy. And? And the phi. The dilaton. The dilaton, the anti symmetric P, and the graviton. How do you see that? Well, it's whatever you get by taking a vector times a vector. So that's symmetric traceless, anti symmetric, and the trace. Okay? Here it's simpler. You don't have to take anything, times anything, it's whatever you get. Just the just the gate. Very good. Okay? And you can work out when you get higher and higher levels. Fantastic. Okay. So that's it. We completed our canonical quantization of uh, the open string and light cone gauge. And we've understood already a lot of physics. And the, the lot of physics that we've understood is that in the same sense that the closed string gave us gravitons interacted with many, thing, many other things, the open string gives us gauge bosons interacted with many other things. You know, I've had the first lots of massive stuff. And there's always this irritating tachyon that we don't know how to do it, but we'll, we'll go away more sophisticated constructions and may or may not be physical. Yeah, there was a talk in this year's strings conference trying to claim that they understood the tenet in point of the stachyon condensation. Not sure it's entirely conclusive, but it was interesting. And it, and, 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 let's not Okay, so, great. So now, now, now. So now, you remember, what, what else did we do for open strings? The next thing we did when we were trying to understand open strings was to understand this quantization in a more sophisticated manner. Okay, well, we, we did two things. We first understood the word sheet theory of the string in a more sophisticated manner, the language of conformity there. And then we understood the quantization of the string, this integration over metrics, in a more sophisticated manner. Okay, let's follow that, that path. So, the first thing that we did in trying to understand things in conform. So, first, our first goal is now to try to understand the world sheet theory of the open string slightly more specifically. Okay? We'll understand the Euclidean space like we did the close closed Okay? So, the first thing that we did was to remind ourselves that, so we analytically continue to Euclidean space. And then make the formal transformation from the cylinder to the plane. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to analytically continue the Euclidean space and make a conformal transformation from the strip to whatever we get. So how do we decide what we get? Well, let's remind ourselves of that and what the what the what the continuity is. Omega, which is equal to sigma one plus i sigma two. These were the coordinates of the strip. Sigma two is i times tau. Okay? And then we define z is equal to uh, e to the power minus i. Okay? Which really 
Kita tu sigma one, sigma dua sih. Itu tu bermakna saya sigma one plus sigma two. Okay, so you remember that what I did was to take well, lines of constant time on the cylinder with constant surface on the Z. Okay, uh, the size of the circle was determined was decided by what time? T equals infinity was the infinite size circle. T equals minus infinity was the origin, zero size circle. T equals zero was the unit circle. Okay, now what are we going to take? So let's uh, let's look at how this. All that was correct when we, when uh, sigma ran from zero to two pi. But now sigma runs from zero to pi. So we have the same thing first before that, except that we have not dumped the whole plane but the half plane. The origin, lines of constant sigma two, are circles that are ever bigger or smaller, and we, all of this action is happening on the half plane. This is the z, z half plane.
maybe there was an eye in the previous expansion. So I think maybe that's the same. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Okay, there is an idea of this question C adlet. Uh, but where could it have come from unless there was an I? So I think the whole previous expansion should have had an I. Uh, now the way to check that is to check whether the commutation relations I claimed. What? I think we got to Let me check that uh, on the fly since, since there's some um, sorry, so let's let's back up. Okay, so we had an expansion which had alpha prime by two. We started with no i. Okay, alpha prime by two. Then we had alpha n by n, and we had e to the power i n sigma plus e to the power i psi n sigma times e to the power n. Okay, now. Uh, when we work this out, what do we get? So let's do that really carefully. We get uh, i in. Okay, so the i is in the new one. That's the only important thing, right? So we get d alpha n with d alpha minus n into i by n. This is what we got. Now, the standard guy is d p wedge. Okay, so this tells us that alpha minus n commutate to alpha n is equal to i divided by n by n. So we got the wrong. You see, when you have dp wedge dx, you have an x commutate to p is equal. How about move this? I've got there d alpha minus n with d alpha. Here you have d alpha minus n with d alpha n. Uh, let's check that. Uh, let's check that. We have d x dot with, with integral d x dot with d x. Yes. Okay. So what we get if we take alpha n from here, we we'll get a plus i. So we get d alpha n wedge d alpha minus n, but then you get a minus one by n. With alpha a minus n. So we get plus i n into uh, oh. no, no, but we, we are always dividing by no, it's plus i n by n into minus one by n. Oh, you're right. Okay, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. Next one, plus n. Uh, Yeah, so where does the i come from? No, wait, 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 let's take this, let's take this. That is probably... No, 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 you know. Oh, wait. You know the way that it So what, what's the right way to transform x from one side to the other? You don't transform x, you transform del x. Because yes. del x is a good conformal operator. Yes. Now del x is a conformal operator of weight 1. Okay? So the transformation property, the, the transformation rule that takes you from x of w okay, to x of uh, 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 that has a line. That's that's the key. You see, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, let, let me clear this. Out.
Okay, I'm going to Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Let, let me try to clear up this eye for next class. Well, okay. okay. We probably did it correctly for the close string. If you, if you look up your notes there, we probably had, had, had the eyes correctly there. Uh, it's the same story. Right? But I'll, I'll, I'll look it up and clear that up. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I just mentioned it. Uh, it's probably the right thing to do. Okay, since this is the last class, I'm going to ask
If we wanted what the y field was here, it was left moving part. But what the y field was here was the right moving part at the corresponding point here. 2 pi minus sigma, right? So we're doing the same thing here. We're saying if we're interested in what the y field is here, it's the angle. Okay? If we're interested in what the y field is here, okay, it's the anti-analytic part, but at the corresponding reflected point, where the where the uh, uh, where the where the imaginary part is reflected. Okay. Now, uh, the fact that we have this nice periodic function in y when we did that before, okay, translates to the fact that this is just some nice well-behaved analytic function on this whole plane. Okay? It's basically the fact, you know, you would, you would, have, you would have to check that uh, derivatives here match, but they do from the boundary conditions. It's basically the, you know, the boundary conditions are the boundary word, remember del plus is equal to del minus, okay? Which is del z is equal to del z bar. At the boundary, right? Because del z of x is equal to del z part of x, which tells you that this way of doing it gives you matching derivatives at the boundary. So this is a z part. And, and, and the zero mode will give a branch. Yeah, the zero mode is going to be a free mode. Right. So, uh, uh, so it will be log z. Yeah. It, if we, if, if, yes. So, so, good so really, this will be useful only for the field del y. Yes. Then, then it's all. Then it's all. As usual, when we deal with the formal field theory, the field x or the field y is not a good field. The field del x. So we never use these tricks for the zero. The zero mode doesn't. This trick doesn't do anything nice with zero. But it does for all the oscillators. A clear way to separate the oscillators from the zero mode is taken. Okay. So, this nice doubling trick that we described at the level of, uh, uh, of this field of the cylinder and the strip uh, becomes the even nicer than the It was the same thing. Defined from 0 to 2 pi means defined on the whole complex. It's just translating that into this, this language. It's the same thing. Okay? But uh, it's very nice. Okay? All the conformal field theory tricks that we played. All the conformal field theory tricks that we play when analyzing the closed string go through from the, for the analysis of the, of, the, of the open string when we use this double field one. Okay? Uh, so, in particular, for instance, um, yeah, so what, what, what are the various things that we should, we should do? Um, the, I'm going to suggest you three exercises. Okay, the first exercise is to compute the commutation relation between alpha m and alpha a using the formula. What do I mean by that? Write down, in terms of the field y, write down a contour integral expression for alpha m. Okay? And then use the OP, the usual OP between x and x, okay, to compute the commutation relations in the way that we did it 20,000 times in the previous class. Okay? I want each of you to do this exercise for next time, just to remind ourselves of all these techniques. It's the same thing as for the open string, but please do it. It'll also help check whether this i is correct. It's directly in, uh, in set space. Okay? So please do this. Okay. Secondly, compute the commutation relations between t and t. Oh, I mean, L, M, and M. So, do the usual expansion of uh, T of Z is equal to sum over L, M by Z to pi root plus 2. Okay? And once again, compute the commutation relations between L, M, and L, M using this, uh, using the, uh, uh, okay, of course, the T, T, O, P remains unchanged.
because the same expression in terms of in terms of this, huh? you know, using that compute combination between t uh, between uh, uh, between lm and lm. What, what I'm asking you to do is to just repeat everything you did for the drug stream. It's the same exercise, just identical. Okay, but I'm asking you to do it anyway, just to remind yourself of that. Oh, so please, for the next class, just do these exercises. Okay, and uh, uh, lastly, lastly, how does the state operator work? Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, okay. So. See, how does it work for closed strings? So first let's work in the W plane, the physical W plane before we can be done. Okay, how does it work for closed strings? Closed strings we had uh, the, this whole circle. The whole circle, boundary conditions in that circle, uh, for the path integral in that circle, define the, define the state. Now we can use scaling to shrink this thing and to, to, to make it as, you know, as small as we want it. That defines an operator insertion into our feedback. Okay. How would we work? How does it work here? Okay. Here, how does it work? It works. Uh, once again, we've got state here. We shrink it. And we get as near to this point as we want. What do we get? We get an operator insertion at the boundary of our worksheet. Is this here? Okay? Is this clear? Just let me just remind you of the closed window stuff. In that situation, state was defined by the boundary condition of the path integral here. Yeah? But by scaling, we just shrink that to as small a to as small a circle as we wanted, and then effectively there was a local insertion somewhere in the world sheet. It happened to be the origin, but the origin is not a special point. It's like any other point. Once you know to define an insertion at any point, you know to define it everywhere. It's the local operator. So that defines a local operator somewhere in the bulk of a world sheet. Now, however, how does it work for the open screen? Okay. So for the open string, it works as follows. A state, where is a state defined? A state is defined on a line with constant tau in W. Right? Which was some semicircle. This is where we give up our boundary conditions for the path that we can find state. Scaling brings it down here. So we get some local insertion at a point. Now this point is nothing special in the sense that you can move it anywhere along the boundary. But clearly, it comes with the bulk. So boundary point is different from a bulk. Okay? So the state operator map for open strings establishes an isomorphism between operators that you can write down on the boundary of the worksheet and states on the, on, on the strip. Is this clear? Okay? Now, how are operators in the boundary of the world sheet different from operators in the bulk? Okay? You see, what were the operators in this X theory? What were the operators on the uh, in the bulk? Effectively, what you had was any number of holomorphic derivatives on X or any number of anti-holomorphic derivatives on X times each of the bulk. These were the set of operators. Okay? Now, on the boundary, you have fewer. Why? Yes, what are the boundary conditions? Then sigma of x, now, what's that? Now, just z and z bar. Then z x is then z bar. Then z x is then z bar. So, suppose you try to insert del z bar to the bar n of x. That's the same thing as inserting del z. 
So instead of having two sets of operators, all the various derivatives you can put on Z, the Z derivatives you can put, and products thereof. Then what is the most general operator? We could have had del Z to del Z to the power n1 of x times a n1 times a. all power to, to where power huh? times del Z power. Remember how the state operator map uh, uh, state operator map work. Del z to the power n1 and x map to a n1. The holomorphic a n1 a minus n1 acting on the back. This operator map map to a minus n1 acting a n1 times. Okay? The fact that you can have products of both holomorphic derivatives of x and anti-holomorphic derivatives. Told you you could have you have the fork space both left hookers and right hookers. That was how the state operator map worked. For the closure. Now, however, you don't have two sets of derivatives of x you can put, you only have monomorphic or anti-holomorphic. There's no difference. Okay? And that maps to the fact that on the strip, we have only one set of x. Let's call the model. Good for anti Okay? So my, my third exercise for you is to work this out in detail. Okay? So what I want you to do is to repeat the arguments that we had to close to. Namely, uh, if you remember the way we worked was to uh, was to say, suppose for the closed strip we had the insertion of del z to the power n in, in x, yeah? and then we worked out what state that corresponded. How did we work it out? We worked it out by surrounding it by some a operator and finding what we got when we acted by a. And that completely determined it. Okay? So work this out again for the open strip. Okay, you can work it out either the y language or the x language, but somehow. Work it out and find this isomorphism once again. We, we've just, I just spelled out the answer, you know what you're going to get, but work that out to your own satisfaction. And if there's something confusing coming up to me. Is this clear? Okay? So, all of the conformity theory, uh, I've only, by the way, reviewed the parts of the conformity theory discussion we had. If you remember, we went through this in five or six lectures. So it was long, okay? I only re reviewed the parts that are different. To Anything that, for instance, involved deriving an equation of motion and what that meant inside the path integral or no third star and so all these are local properties of the of the string world shape path integral and they don't change at all. Well, the only thing that we discussed is how to have in boundaries changes things. Okay? So that ends my my brief review of effectively chapters one and two of which is the paths involving the open string. Okay, let's quickly, uh, quickly, quickly uh, go on to chapter whatever it is. It's three. The part involving the open string, chapter three of it. Okay? So that's the part in, in, uh, about honest quantization hmm? of the string. That was chapter four. So chapter three is called the point out of part in case. This is the Chapter four is string spectrum. Maybe we have different issues. <laughs> <laughs> I have to use spectrum. No, no. What I want to do is to set up the path integral. No, no. I want to understand what happens to BC hosts uh, when, when we have a uh, when we have a Okay. So again, we're not going to review. We're not going to do that whole quantization procedure. Okay? We've done it. But just remind ourselves about the elements that are necessary to understand what we. Uh, you know what, what we want. So what was the end? Of the, you know what? What did we have? We had G alpha beta, some world sheet, uh, world sheet metric, right? and we had x complete. And then we went to some conformity. So we said G alpha beta is equal to some fiducial metric, for instance, eta alpha, but some G hat alpha beta times into the power i. We used the Fibonacci methods to do that, and then. Uh, 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 and then we worked out uh, 
what the finding of the determinant for this gauge fixing. Now you remember how we worked that. We said up to well, how does a diffeomorphism change? How does a diffeomorphism change G tilde? You know, how does the diffeomorphism change that? So what is the public of determinant? So uh, you're supposed to look at the variation of your gauge condition and then compute the determinant of that. Our gauge condition was that G was equal to this. So we have to look at the variation of this under our, our symmetric transformation. So the variation of that was del alpha V beta plus del beta V alpha. This was under diffeomorphism. So then we added a conformal transformation make this traceless. So that the other part was true. Okay, so uh, divided by 2 minus delta V G hat alpha beta uh, by 2. Okay, so this was uh, diffeomorphism plus this plus particular conformal transformation. Uh, I don't want the two in the second term, but let's take the trace. Uh, I do, right? Because this, this trace is this is trace is two. I want the would have been by D generally. These two. Okay. Yeah. So um, we had this change. And then the public pop of determinant was was generated by trace by the and the basic effect of delta function parameter. So we have a B alpha uh, distributed times del alpha C beta and del beta C alpha by 2 minus del beta C by 2. Okay, this is what they all are. Of course, though uh, it turned out to be most convenient to write these the B with the lower indices and the C with the upper. Uh, when we did that, it was all, it was in a local analytic patch. This action always reduced to b del bar c plus b bar s bar. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I want the basic thing that I want to remind you of was the origin of these c's and these b's. The c was simply the infinitesimal diffeomorphism parameter. Converted into an anti-intermediate uh, field, and 